Summer 2001, as Steve Jobs holds a prototype of the iPod, one person holds its breath. Jobs had demanded that the device be developing less than a year to be ready for the holiday season. And it is not going well. The leader of the iPod team had barely been an Apple employee for a couple of months, and to save the project, he will have to take some extreme measures that could feel like a blasphemy. But all of this will lead to a series of incredible coincidences that will define the future of the company forever. This is that story. Brought to you by the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle. It's the start of 1997, and Apple is about to go bankrupt. Jobs had been kicked out of the company, and was now leader and founder of a workstation and higher education company called Next. While it was not particularly economically successful, their operating system turned out to be the perfect base for Apple to catch up. They had to negotiate with a very pissed off Steve Jobs, but for $429 million, I'm sure he could forgive them. Especially since that brought him back to the company. And as he slowly clawed himself back into the position of interim CEO, he had the power to take the company back to its computer roots. And Jobs had a simple plan for that. May 6, 1998. Jobs reveals a translucent all-in-one computer built entirely into a small 15-inch monitor, very reminiscent of the original Macintosh that made the company huge on its heyday, the iMac. But to him, this was just a start. While Apple going back to basics was the necessary thing to do, the iMac was just a Trojan horse, a hub for something different. You see, starting on the second generation, the iMac had Firewire ports. An interface developed by Apple in collaboration with several companies to provide fast data while charging the device at a time when USB was very slow. So, what if the iMac could be used as a hub for portable devices? Jobs had decided the best place to start the strategy was a device that had already widely adopted Firewire, video cameras. But this focus on video was about to be knocked out of existence, thanks to another revolution that was happening in computers. Napster. If you lived through the early 2000s, this is the name that either filled you with excitement or panic if you're a music executive. This peer-to-peer -peer service growing on the back of extremely efficient audio compression ushered a true systemic change in the way we consume music, and for nearly a decade made piracy the mainstream way to enjoy music for people online. And with MP3 downloading came burning your own music CDs. Blank CD sales exploded, to the point that for a couple of years, blank CD sales in the US outnumbered the entire country's population. But I'm uh, pleased to announce today that I'm gonna drop the interim title. While this was all happening, Steve Jobs completed his Apple comeback by dropping the title of interim CEO to just CEO. And he was ready to get Apple back into the future that he envisioned. And this decision was just in time to realize his mistake. The center of the new media revolution was not video, it was music. We need a music player software for Mac and we need it now. Make an offer to buy whatever's the best out there. Now the best music app in macOS at the moment was called Audion. But they were already in the process of being sold to someone else and not available. So a second best option was needed, and that second option was way more than a music player. And to understand why, we have to look at this little guy. This is the Rio PMP 300, and it was one of the first commercially successful MP3 players, a device designed to play only digital music. So of course, the music industry tried to sue the company out of existence as soon as it was announced. Objection! But in a surprise legal twist, the lawsuit was thrown out under copyright exceptions for backups, as the device was meant to be used to listen to music ripped from legal CDs. That might not have been the case in real life, but now the MP3 player revolution was unstoppable, no matter where that MP3 came from. And this started a fascinating series of events. Hearing the news of the lawsuit, a group of ex-Apple employees decided to make a program to play music and sync with the Rio for Mac called SoundJam, which became the second best music software for Mac. And that is what Apple ended up buying and turning into its own player, iTunes. But during the process of porting over its ability to sync, engineers at Apple came to an interesting realization. This thing kinda sucked. In fact, most MP3 players at the time did. Flash memory at the time was super low capacity, so it could barely hold a few songs. One of the few exceptions was the Nomad Jukebox, a hard drive based device that could store a lot of music, but was the size of a CD player, twice as heavy, 
and the battery lasted less than an hour. And it costed $500. Even worse, the device used USB 1.1 to transfer songs, which meant filling the device could take hours. It was terrible from every angle. But the iMac had FireWire, which could theoretically fill the device quickly. So suddenly, an Apple engineer whose name has been lost to time had an idea. What if we make a music player? But someone had heard that idea, and now he could not get it out of his head. John, we need to make a pocket-sized music player. Steve, seriously? You can't keep doing this. Look, John, it is the perfect next step in our hub strategy. A device that seamlessly syncs with iTunes. We have the technology and talent to make something better than all the garbage out there in the market. Look, Steve, I get the idea, but the Nomad MP3 player that you hated the least? It is huge for a reason. That drive is pretty big. Can't you find a smaller drive? Maybe. I don't know. I'll keep an eye out. Find me the drive, John. And as fate will have it, not long after that conversation, as both Rubenstein and Jobs visit Tokyo for the Mac World Japan Expo, Rubenstein visits Toshiba, one of the component suppliers, to check up on what they have been developing. Towards the end of the meeting, one of the Toshiba engineers makes a very convenient reveal. We have just finished development on this. Some of our engineers figured out how to make the smallest hard drive we have ever seen. To be honest, we have no idea what to use it for. Maybe you would be interested in making a small laptop with it? While Rubenstein keeps a professional poker face on the outside, on the inside, he's losing it. Steve, I got it. I found the hard drive. I just need $10 million. Do it. With a $10 million check under his arm, Rubenstein quickly convinced a shocked Toshiba to license the hard drive that they had no idea how to use exclusively to Apple for a secret project codenamed P68 Dulcimer. The technology was ready, but everyone at Apple was too busy to cover this project. So what if they brought in someone? After calling and asking around his contacts, John heard of a certain character that might fill this role perfectly. This is Tony Fadell. At the time, he was known for working with Philips to lead engineering on the Nino, a PDA-sized PC run in Windows CE. But after a meeting with Audible, the audiobook company, he started to wonder if the future lay in small devices to listen to music on audiobooks. Since Philips showed no interest in his idea, he left to create his own company called Fuse, with plans of delivering a hard drive-based device that could make it super easy to play music ripped from a CD. But this was not going well. He struggled to find investors for the project and was about to run out of money. But his luck was about to change. While taking a trip to get his mind out of his failing company, his cell phone started ringing. Hello, this is John Rubenstein from Apple Hardware. I have a proposal for you. Fadel was extremely confused as to why Apple will come for him. When they finally revealed to him that Apple was trying to hire him to create something similar to his idea, he could not believe it. It took some convincing to get him to join as a full Apple employee, but the iPod team had found its leader. However, he will soon find himself doubting his decision. Jobs wanted the device out by Christmas that very year. Even if Rubenstein had already basically secured a provider for the screen battery and the exclusive Toshiba hard drive, getting a product from scratch and ready for production in time for the holidays was going to be nearly impossible. But maybe they did not have to. For every new type of industry, there are those who make a killing making the product people use, and then there are those who make a name of themselves silently providing the technology that powers those products. This is how Porto Player came to be. A relatively obscure company founded in 1999, Porto Player had made a name by building the ships and software powering a lot of MP3 players out there. Fadel had been hoping to hire them for his music player idea, but could never gather enough capital. But now... He was an Apple employee with Apple resources, and things were different. There was one prototype that had caught his eye, a player the size of a cigarette package. It was very ugly, its interface clunky and difficult to use, but the shape was perfect. And more importantly, all the firmware and software was basically already done. He could work from the space to turn this into an Apple product. I have an offer. I need your company to work with Apple on a project exclusively. Exclusively? I'm sorry, but there is no way we can drop all of our existing clients. When do we start? 
With the draconian deadline right around the corner, the entire company immediately pivoted all their operations into getting the player done in time. With the mysterious Porter player design providing all the lower levels of the OS and Apple buying or developing all the higher levels. Curiously enough, the device ran on an energy-efficient ARM core. Because of this, everyone on the music player team had to use tools developed by ARM, and those tools run only on Windows. I guess desperate times require desperate measures. With the device beginning to take shape, the team faced its next hurdle, convincing Jobs that the project was headed in the right direction. April 2001, Apple Headquarters, fourth floor, conference room. With every high-level employee involving Project Dulcimer in the room, the time had come for Fadel to convince Jobs that his vision for Dulcimer was the right one. He begins his very carefully put-together presentation with a talk on what other companies were doing in this space. Forget about those guys, they have no idea what they're doing. Now show me that you know what you're doing. What is the battery life of the player? Oh, 10 hours. We'll make it work for 10 hours. Size? A pack of cigarettes at worst. We are trying to get it to the size of a pack of cards. As Jobs approved the general idea, Fadil could not help but be surprised of how things work at Apple. At Philips, these decisions will have taken dozens of presentations and meetings. What about the controls? Actually, I have an idea for that. This was Phil Shiler, head of Apple Marketing. In his hand was a Bang & Olufsen Biocom 6000, a home phone that had a very particular wheel on its center used to navigate menus. The result was instantaneous, everyone in the room immediately clicked with the idea. Now it was just a matter of implementing everything in time. Something about this product had captured all of Jobs' attention, which was both a blessing and a curse. Soon the design of Dulcimer became an iterative process of showing Jobs a prototype and he becoming frustrated at something that needed to be fixed immediately. One day, as they showed the latest close to final prototype to him, he simply claimed, This is too big, you gotta make it smaller. Look, we have done everything we can. The components are too tightly packed together at this point. <gasps> Bubbles. That means there is still air inside. Make it smaller. Eight months from the moment they had started, a full prototype iPod was completed. With the final design touches coming directly from the legendary Johnny Ive, the device was unlike any other player out there. The final touch was the name. Bini Chieko, a freelance copywriter, came up with a name that just stuck. If the iMac was the digital hub, it was like a mothership, and gadgets that connect to it will be pods that go into the world, returning to the mothership to resupply and refuel. So the iMac is the mothership, and this is the iPod. With the deadline for Christmas production coming up and the production lines being set up, it was time for the last battery of tests for the device, and it was then when a last minute wrinkle almost jeopardized the whole project. As the final prototypes were tested, one major problem immediately came up. With the hard drive constantly spinning to play music, the longest the battery could sustain was 3 hours, a far cry from the 10 they had promised and nowhere near the range that Jobs will find acceptable. For a couple of months, everyone believed in panic that they had done all of that just to create a 3-hour music player. Everyone on the team scrambled for a solution. And what they eventually found was pretty clever. For other hard drive based players, if the device was shaken or moved suddenly, the hard drive might stop reading and the song will interrupt. Other manufacturers had solved this issue by having a small solid memory buffer that loaded the current song, loading from disk only when it was safe to do so. But for the iPod, those memory chips were expanded to a full 32 megabytes of memory. Not only will this mean that the device will be sold as having very extensive skip protection, but also meant that the chip could store not just the current song, but several upcoming ones, only spinning up the disk to load the chip in short bursts. Taking the battery just over the line of the promised 10 hours and giving Jobs something else to market on the reveal. 20 minute skip protection. That's not, tr that's not 20 seconds. 20 minute skip protection. So you can take iPod bicycling, mountain climbing, jogging, you name it, and you're not going to skip a beat. With the device finished for the deadline, the iPod was ready for a release towards the end of 2001 with a tagline that Jobs had grown attached to during the development process. iPod, a thousand songs in your pocket. While there was some skepticism on the tech press, particularly around the price tag, the iPod will eventually succeed to a point that it will rapidly turn Apple from a computer company into a handheld gadget company. And that will start a path that will push the whole company into a direction that would change the world in ways beyond music. And even into the world of espionage. Oh wait, you have never heard about that? 
Because much, much later into the story, a secret group inside of Apple will set out to make a small favor to a branch of the US government to create a mysterious iPod, of which the only record that exists is the memory of one ex-Apple employee. So that is the topic that I chose for this month's episode of SideQuest, my exclusive side series on side stories to the main videos. So if the main video is about the commercial wars that led to the invention of the touchpad, SideQuest is about how the same group invented the touchscreen and the extreme measures they had to take for the clients to take it seriously. And SideQuest is exclusive to Nebula, a creator-owned streaming service that is rapidly being filled with exclusive content by a growing collective of educational-ish creators. No joke, this channel exists only thanks to those who had decided to sign up and watch videos in Nebula, 